Okay, let's get into our topic about the biggest lie about end time events. The time of persecutions under Stalin, which started in 1924, were a time where entire Adventist congregations were wiped out. About 70% of all Adventist preachers and church leaders were killed. Nearly 3,500 church members, about one-fourth of the Soviet Adventist membership at that time, lost their lives due to persecution, hunger, and detention in labor camps. The Russian preacher Alexander Gritz represents one of these cases. Gritz testified of his faith openly in his East Siberian captivity in 1944 until he was tied to a tree in the extreme cold and water was poured over him until he froze to death. The Russian-German leaders Jacob Reiner and Jacob Cross were shot in labor camps in the late 1930s for refusing to work on the Sabbath and for conducting baptisms in secret. So why were Adventists hit so hard at this time? Well, one important reason already mentioned is because um, of the Sabbath keeping. Those who, like Daniel of old, were willing to die rather than break one of God's commandments were especially targeted. Those were Sabbath keepers in the past. However, just recently, David J. Stewart of Capital City Baptist Church called Adventist Sabbath keeping blasphemous. He went on to say that keeping the Sabbath as evidence of salvation is a lie of the devil and that Sabbath keepers are false prophets and that Seventh-day Adventism is a satanic religion rooted in the new world order and it will take you to the lake of fire. He also stated that Sabbath keepers are, are idolaters worshiping the creature more than the creator. And he calls us heretics and finally... He says that the doctrine of Sabbath keeping as evidence of salvation is of the devil. So these are some pretty strong words, wouldn't you say? This is actually a fulfillment of Bible prophecy that not only Adventists understand, uh, I, I should say that only Adventists understand, and I don't say this because I think Adventists are more righteous than others, we're not, but because we have insights into prophecy that no other church has. And you say, well, that's a pretty bold claim, Pastor Daniel. Can you back that up? Well, I think I can. In my talk entitled, The Biggest Lie About End Time Events, <clears throat> our opening scripture is Daniel chapter 6. If you'd like to follow along, open your Bibles there. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your goodness towards us. Father, we crave for the Holy Spirit to be present during this presentation and to use me in a very special way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In this message on last day events, we're going to see that when evil men were motivated by jealousy, that they used the law of God, especially the Ten Commandments, as an excuse to persecute Daniel and later on Christ. And again, he's going to use it in the future to persecute the remnant people of God. Now, this is especially applicable in our day. Many people who are not Adventists don't understand that Adventists are one of the only people groups in Christianity who believe in keeping all Ten Commandments of God. Daniel 6, let's start with verse 3. Daniel 6 and verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much that he was faithful neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, shall, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So what does verse 4 mean when it says to bring charges or find occasion against Daniel? Well, they were looking for an excuse to accuse him or get rid of him, weren't they? And when these leaders sought to find fault with Daniel, what does verse 4 say of Daniel? It says they couldn't find any fault with him. And so it sounds to me like Daniel, he had the character of Christ perfectly reproduced in Daniel. And so we should strive to be like Daniel, shouldn't we? Well, strive to be like Jesus, but Daniel's a great example as well, isn't he? Now, it gets really interesting. When they couldn't find fault with Daniel, what did they resort to according to verse 5? Now, folks, verse 5 is a very important verse here. 
It says in verse 5, except we find it against him, concerning what? The law of his God. That's interesting because the book of Revelation, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. The book of Revelation says the same thing is going to be repeated just before Jesus comes that ushers in the mark of the beast. Notice why the devil is angry at the woman or God's church. There are two things that the woman does that enrages the devil. And we must understand, folks, that the devil inspires nominal Christians in our day to persecute God's people who keep the commandments of God. Look at verse 17, Daniel 12. Uh, I mean, Revelation 12. And the dragon or the devil was angry with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which, number one, keep the commandments of God. Number two, have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So in Daniel 6, angry, evil men used the law of God against Daniel because they knew he kept it. In Revelation 12, we see that repeated to God's people in the last days of earth's history. So folks, it's only those who keep all t- ten commandments of God that will receive the full wrath of Satan. They are going to be persecuted. Now, I could talk about the testimony of Jesus Christ, also known as the spirit of prophecy, that enrages the devil too, but I don't have time. But know that the spirit of prophecy is also an identifying mark of the remnant church. It will invoke the wrath of Satan. Now, there's a prophetic interpretation principle that's used in this story that goes like this. What was local and literal becomes universal and spiritual in prophecy. All right, so locally and literally, this was Daniel being persecuted for keeping the Ten Commandments of God. And we see that. And in Revelation 12, the law of God's actually going to be central in the battle between good and evil in the last days of earth's history. Let's add to Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 14, 12, and 22, 14. It says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, folks, I have a question for you. Does God give us a 10% discount in commandment keeping? Well, if you ask most of the Christian world today, they say, yes, you don't have to keep the Bible Sabbath. And so they do not qualify any Christian who believes the law was nailed to the cross, we're not under the law, we're under grace, or whatever the excuse may be. If you don't keep all of the commandments of God, you don't qualify as a follower, a complete follower of Christ. And look at Revelation twenty two fourteen, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. So what's interesting about sinful human nature is that it wants to do the exact opposite of what God wants us to do. So that's one reason that there's so much angst about the law of God in today's Christian world. It's really only aimed at the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, right? And because they don't keep the Sabbath, they have to attack those who do or at least discredit them. So we should commit to God not only to believe in the commandments of God, but to obey them. What do you say? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first became an Adventist and I read the Adventist interpretation about the Sabbath issue in the last days of earth's history, I thought the Adventists got it wrong. But it wasn't the Adventists who got it wrong, it was me. I'm going to explain what I mean in just a moment. Now, why did I become an Adventist when I thought their interpretation of end time events and the Sabbath were off? Well, That's because everything else that the Adventists taught, I believed. And I I looked at Adventism, I looked at the Bible, I compared the two, and I said the Adventists are the closest ones to obeying the Bible. They're not perfect by any means, but they're the closest denomination. So do you know what converted me on this topic of Sabbath keeping and end time events? It's when I became a pastor and especially an evangelist. And I started seeing the hatred and controversy surrounding the Sabbath. You can talk about any other commandment from the Ten Commandments, and most of the Christian world will say, hooray, that's wonderful. But as soon as you talk about the Sabbath, you'll be accused of a legalist, and sometimes people get very angry at you. People who were wonderful Christians in all other areas of the Bible crumple when the Sabbath is clearly presented to them. 
And if there's a clear teaching in the Bible, it is of Sabbath keeping. What do you say? Let me give you a couple of examples. I was doing an evangelistic series in America and in Indiana a few years ago. And I had this woman come. She, had, she was an amputee. She had, I think, her right hand had been cut off. And um, so she just had a stump here. And she was coming to my meeting. She was a Sunday-keeping, beautiful Christian woman. And every time I'd call out the, the scriptures, she would take the stump of her hand and she would turn the pages of the Bible to look up the verses that I was calling out. After the meeting, she'd come up to me and say, Pastor Daniel, that was a fantastic sermon. I'm learning so much from you. And every night, it was almost the same thing. And then one night, uh, she came to me and she shared her story as to why she had an amputation. She said, you know what? I was born and raised in a beautiful Christian family. My parents loved Jesus, and they were really good examples. They weren't legalists. They, they, they loved me. They loved Jesus. And she said, for no reason, when I grew up and I got of age and I left home, I left Jesus, I left the Bible, and I left the church. Again, she said, there was no excuse for me to do that. And then she did that for many years. And then one day she woke up in the hospital and she had a, a really, really serious infection. And when she woke up, her hands and her feet were purple from lack of circulation. The doctors had to amputate that right hand in order to save her life. And she considered that a wake-up call from God. And she said, you know what? I've been away from Jesus for so many years now. I'm coming back to Jesus. And she did. And she held up that stump to me. And she said, Pastor Daniel, I praise God for this amputation. Do you know why? Because it drove me back to Jesus. I thought, man, this woman has strong faith in Jesus. I really admired her. She even quoted that one from Jesus where he said, if your hand offends you, cut it off, for it's better to go to heaven maimed than to go to hell with both of your hands. And so... She's coming to these seminars, and I saw her great faith, and I thought, this is great. She's going to accept the Sabbath truth. But guess what happened, folks? As soon as I presented the Sabbath, she crumpled. She stopped coming to the seminar. She rejected the Sabbath, rejected the Ten Commandments. Now, folks, my point is, here's a very godly, committed woman as soon as you present the Sabbath, she goes away. What does Revelation 12, 17 say? The devil is angry at those who keep the commandments of God. And so no wonder people like that, when they get presented the Ten Commandments, they have to make a decision, don't they? I had another experience, a, a church right here in New Zealand when I was in the Hamilton area, pre, uh, pastoring in the Hamilton area. Um, I was in church one day, Sabbath morning, and a young man came in all excited, real happy and joyful. He had found Doug Batchelor on YouTube, and he had found the Sabbath through Doug Batchelor. And this was the first Sabbath that he was keeping that day. And he was so thrilled about finding the Sabbath. I even got him up front to give his testimony. And all the church members were just so happy about that. However, what happened is that his wife, a Sunday-keeping church member, she gave him so much opposition. She gave him such a hard time about that. He stopped coming to church. And uh, as far as I know, he stopped keeping the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath is the only commandment that makes the rest of the Christian world angry or at least very uncomfortable, right? Again, I could talk about any of the other nine commandments and they would say, preach it. But as soon as you come to the Sabbath, all of a sudden they stop. So they persecuted Daniel because of jealousy and used his loyalty to the Ten Commandment law as leverage to condemn him. How about in the life of Jesus? Did they also persecute Jesus because of jealousy and use his loyalty to the law of God against him as well? Absolutely. We'll see that in a minute. But for now, before we go there, I feel it's important for us to know from Luke chapter 12 that no matter what you do, you will not be able to avoid hardships and suffering. 
If you serve man, you're going to suffer for it. If you serve God, you will also suffer for it. Let me show you what I mean. Luke chapter 12, and let's look at verse 12, uh, 4. And Jesus said, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and afterward they have no more that they can do. So you can be persecuted for your faith in Jesus, or if you want to avoid that persecution, then you're going to have to face God. Look at the next verse, verse 5, Luke chapter 12, verse 5. But I will forewarn you of whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he has killed has power to cast you into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. So, folks, no matter who you serve, you will be persecuted. If you serve man, then you're going to be in hot water with God. If you serve God, you're going to be in hot water with man. You might as well suffer for Christ's sake and inherit eternal life than to suffer for sin's sake and be a lost sinner, right? I really want to encourage you, really want to encourage you to make that decision to be a commandment keeper. Besides that, if you serve God, he assures you of peace, comfort, and purpose in this life, even though you'll experience persecution. The only way we can experience this peace and comfort is to realize that we become righteous through Jesus' righteousness, not our own. He credits our righteous acts, uh, our unrighteous acts, uh, with his righteousness. And so we are now counted righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, why did the Jews persecute Jesus in John chapter 9? What does uh, John 9 and verse 14 and 16 say? Well, it says, It was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened the blind man's eyes. Hmm, interesting. So they persecuted Jesus for what they called Sabbath breaking. And then verse 16 says, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Why? Well, because he healed this man. He, he, he did the, the hard work of spitting on the ground and making clay of the spittle and anointing his eyes and opened them. The Pharisees persecuted him for what they called Sabbath breaking. So was Jesus really breaking the Sabbath by doing that? Absolutely not. But this gave them a convenient excuse to act out their jealous hatred on Jesus, didn't it? Daniel was also persecuted. They tried to kill him using the law of God as a weapon and for the same reason, right? And as already mentioned, God's last day people are going to be known for, for and persecuted for the same reason according to the prophetic book of Revelation. Now let's zero on, on the Sabbath and last day events. Since the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments that the rest of the Christian world ignores for the most part, Adventists have believed for over a hundred years that the Sabbath is a special test for God's people at the end of time. For instance, now, what I'm going to do right now, folks, this is especially for the non-Adventists out there, I'm going to give you a little understanding of what we believe about end-time events. For instance, over a hundred years ago, a prominent Adventist writer put it this way, and I quote, the commandment, of God that has been almost universally made void is the testing truth for this time. Now, what does she mean when they have been almost universally made void? Well, the popular Christian world today says the Ten Commandments have been nailed to the cross, we're not under the law, we're under grace, so on and so forth. That's what she means. All right, I'll continue on this quotation. The time is coming when all those who worship God will be distinguished by this sign. God will, um, they will be known as the servants of God by this mark of their allegiance to heaven. But all man-made tests will divert the mind from the great and important doctrine that constitutes present truth. Now, folks, I want you to follow this closely. She says the commandments of God are the testing truth for this time. And then she goes on to say, there's going to be man-made tests that will divert the mind from the great and important doctrines. And one of those is the Ten Commandments. Now, if you believe this, then you'll reject the idea 
that the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast. And that lie has been circulating in Christianity, even in Adventism. However, I believe that this is a man-made test that's taking the mind away from the great test. And unfortunately, a lot of us fell for that. Now, I believe the vaccine was a test, and it was a test that a lot of, a lot of people failed on, However, it was not the test. The test is on the Ten Commandments. Now, the statement goes on to say, it is a desire and plan of Satan to bring in among us those who will go to great extremes, people of narrow minds who are critical and sharp. They will be exacting, will seek to enforce rigorous duties and go to great lengths in matters of minor importance through the work of a few of this class of persons the whole body of Sabbath keepers will be designated as bigoted and fanatical. Do you see where this is going, folks? Where this is going is if you're a Sabbath keeper, you're going to be persecuted quite bad. One problem with non-Sabbath keepers, or dare I say Sunday keepers have with us, is they don't understand the issues for the last days as pointed out in Matthew 10. Let's go to Matthew 10. Um, I've got it up on the screen here. They read these verses in Matthew 10, think they don't apply to the Ten Commandments, especially the Sabbath, but if you understand the prophetic significance of the Sabbath, then these verses will be spot on. Now, I'm not saying these verses apply only to the Sabbath. No, they don't. They apply broad, more broad than the Sabbath. However, they certainly include the Sabbath. All right, so Matthew 10, verse 21 and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child, the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house of Beelzebub, or the devil, how much more shall they call them of his own household? Now, folks, do you understand this? If you are a commandment keeper, all 10 of them, you will be called accused of being a devil worshiper. Now, I showed you the pastor at the beginning of my sermon where he certainly called us devil worshipers. And according to Revelation 12, 17, what do God's last day people do that infuriates the devil? Well, we keep the commandments of God, right? And Matthew 10 says we're going to be persecuted and hated and killed. So one of the major reasons God's last day people will be the recipients of this hatred is that we keep the commandments of God. And Revelation 13 says it's because we reject the mark of the beast, which is twofold. First of all, it's accepting the spurious Sabbath of the beast, which is Sunday worship. And the second part is that we refuse to give up the Sabbath worship. Now, I've seen and heard Sabbath keepers mocked and derided because we believe that. As a matter of fact, this is what I said. When I first became an Adventist, I, I didn't believe this prophetic interpretation of the Sabbath, but now I'm a total believer because Sabbath keepers are being persecuted for that very reason. Most of the other Christians, there, there are some Christians who are not Sabbath keepers who are being persecuted, certainly a lot of them, but when you keep the Sabbath, it brings an extra measure of persecution. One sure way to see if we are rightly interpreting this prophecy is to look at a, our interpretation and then see if it's being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. So here's the Adventist interpretation of these prophecies and Revelation in a nutshell. This is written about 100, a little over 100 years ago, and here's what it says. A refusal to obey the commandments of God and a determined determination to cherish hatred against those who proclaim these commandments leads to the most determined war on the part of the dragon whose whole energies are brought to bear against the commandment-keeping people of God. Not only are men not to work with their hands on Sunday, but with their minds 
are they to acknowledge Sunday as the Sabbath? Interesting. Do you see the complete control they want of us? It's not enough for them that we don't work on Sunday, but we are to acknowledge Sunday as a Sabbath, even though we don't agree with it. And if we don't, they're going to, some people will hate us for that. Now, this statement is one of the most important that we're going to look at in this presentation. So please pay attention. And I'm going to quote, when it is considered disloyal to the law of the land to keep the seventh day as a Sabbath, when wolves in sheep's clothing through blindness of mind and hardness of heart are seeking to compel the conscience, shall we give up our loyalty to God? No, no. The wrongdoer is filled with a satanic hatred against those who are loyal to the commandments of God. So here's what she says. She says, Sunday keepers, some of them, not all of them, in the last days of earth's history, they will be filled with a satanic hatred against those who are loyal to the commandments of God. And since there's basically only one denomination in the world who is loyal to all ten of them, then that'll be directed towards us. And so when we see this, we can know that we are seeing prophecy being fulfilled, right? Well, let me show you a video of these very prophecies being fulfilled right before your eyes. And these prophecies are um, unique to Adventist church. I don't know any other church that says this. Um, the wrongdoer is filled with satanic hatred. Not even other Sabbath-keeping churches, I must warn you, that I showed this short video in my church a few months ago, and uh, the members were very upset about it. This is really hard to watch, but it's necessary in light of what's happening in the world right now. Please forgive me for showing it, but I feel it's my duty and it's your benefit to see this. Here it is. And let me just go one step further for all these seven-day Adventists that watch me for some reason and send me letters. You worshiping the devil because you meet on Sunday. Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus became my Sabbath. And I'm here to tell you, I worship on the first day of the week because of the glory of the resurrection. I am not under the law of the Sabbath. Jesus said there will come a day. It doesn't matter when and it doesn't matter where, but it matters who you will worship. I'm telling you, Saturday worship as far as the law is concerned, is a demonic doctrine. Shut up and don't come at me with all that nonsense. You got to worship on Saturday because of the law. I'm not under the law, Scipio. I'm under the grace of the resurrected. All right. So did you see and hear the satanic hatred in this video clip? Uh, so who is this so-called pastor inciting people to hate Sabbath keepers? Well, he's not only got his local congregation, which appears to be a mega church. I think he's got over a thousand in his church. I couldn't really confirm that. But he's not only got them, he's got a big YouTube following as well. And I read the comments on his sermons, and most of them were really excited about his sermon. He's got 26,000 views on one of his sermons. It looks like a typical charismatic church there. And so this satanic hatred against Sabbath keepers being shouted around the world, isn't it? And so this is literally a fulfillment of a prophecy that Adventists have had for many years. And so now we can see that, yes, the dragon was wroth with the woman, Revelation 12, 17, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. Remember the Baptist I quoted at the beginning of my sermon? Remember what he said? You may wonder why these pastors are so angry against Sabbath keepers. There's a risk, and I'm going to sound arrogant when I answer that question, but I believe that some are livid because there's no biblical arguments against the Sabbath. Now, folks, I've been doing this for many years. And I've heard a lot of arguments from other Christians and pastors against the Sabbath. 
none of them hold water as far as the Bible is concerned. So there's no biblical arguments against the Sabbath, and many people are being converted to Sabbath keeping. So, so they get annoyed at us Sabbath keepers, and some even get furious about it. It is plain and simple disobedience pretending to be righteous indignation. They know they're disobedient, but they want to make it appear that they're righteously indignant towards Sabbath keepers. Another thing I should say is that there are some, plenty of Sabbath-keeping churches that are not Adventists, like the Seventh-day Baptists, and there used to be the Church of God Seventh-day, and do you know why I say there used to be? Because the Church of God Seventh-day gave up the Sabbath. Hmm. That's interesting. Why did they do that? Well, the most important reason is that they didn't see the prophetic relevance of the Sabbath. And, and there's only one Sabbath-keeping church that understands the prophetic relevance of the Sabbath, and that's Adventism. Test it, folks. Try it. Go to any other Seventh-day Sabbath church that's not Adventist, and you will not see the prophetic intensity in that church. Guaranteed. For we have a more sure word of prophecy in the spirit of prophecy, don't we? So what are the solutions to the Sabbath persecution that will spread worldwide? I've already mentioned two. Number one, lean on Christ's righteousness, not your own. When hell breaks loose, if we don't know that Jesus is our righteousness, we're not going to be able to stand. You have to have Jesus. Number two, learn the prophetic relevance of Sabbath keeping. This will fortify you against that day. The third one is to fellowship with other believers on the Sabbath. And by the way, watching great sermons on television or First Light or YouTube, that is not fulfilling this need. Now, some people have to stay home, and God understands that. But I'm afraid that the COVID lockdowns have made some of us lazy about church attendance and fellowship. I want to encourage you to not stay in this condition, then the fourth solution, the last solution I have for my time today is be prepared by learning medical missionary work. One of the pioneers of our church put it this way, as religious aggression subverts the liberties of our nation, those who would stand for freedom of conscience will be placed in unfavorable positions. For their own sake, they should, while they have opportunity, become intelligent in regard to disease, its causes, prevention, and cure. All those who do this will find a field of labor anywhere. There will be suffering ones, plenty of them, who will need your help. End of quotation. So when the Sunday laws come in, medical missionary work is unemployment insurance, isn't it? And so learn the medical missionary work. So we need to be moving forward. Folks, none of this cowering down before the devil, for we have an almighty Jesus Christ on our side. We need to go onward and upward doing aggressive evangelism, for time is short. What do you say? All of us need to recommit to the Lord. Some of you need to commit to the Lord for the first time. Some of you need to be reconverted or recommitted to the Lord. And I want to encourage, especially those who are in my viewing audience, some of you need to make a serious commitment to Jesus. Some of you have been thinking about baptism or rebaptism. And I want to encourage you, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, to say in the privacy of your own heart, Jesus, I'm ready to make that move. I'm ready to make that major step of baptism and of following you all the way.